second. Tuesday, um, and we spent the entire meeting talking about the subject of home rule. We had a presentation from um, our lawyers uh, uh, that included Stu, but also Steve Elrod, who's not here tonight, and our deputy village manager Larson to talk about home rule. Um, I'm going to be very brief about home rule. We spent a whole meeting on it, and there will be a lot of discussion about it going forward. The Illinois Constitution has two kinds of municipalities, home rule and non-home rule. Uh, briefly, non-home rule communities are limited to what is specifically authorized uh, by the Constitution or the legislature. Home rule communities have more authority than that non-home rule communities very limited. Um, if you are a larger community, which I think is 25,000 people or more, you become automatically a home rule community unless you don't want to be, in which case you can take it away by referendum. If you are smaller than 25,000, then you are non-home rule unless you have a referendum to approve it. Glencoe has been forever a non-home rule community. There was a time when that was true with many of our neighbors. Um, but, uh, but that is no longer the case. Uh, this is not just inside baseball. Um, what our neighbors found is that um, by not being home rule communities, they were very limited on what they could do for their residents, and they were often spending more money trying to do it because of the limitations. Um, the village has been thinking about home rule for a long time. In the late teens and running up to 2020, the village looked very seriously at asking the residents to become home rule, uh, which is a process. We have to have a referendum at the end of it. And just as the village was looking into this, the pandemic happened. And so it got tabled. Um, uh, I came in after then. Most of the board members here came in after then. So what we talked about uh, at our meeting on Tuesday was what was home rule about and did we think we should look into asking the residents to approve or disapprove home rule at a referendum. Um, following the discussion we had and the advice we had, I think the sense uh, of the group, and that includes me, is that we should ask our residents to approve home rule that we think it would be best for the village. But it's, there are two sides to home rule and we recognize that. I would say in a nutshell, the argument against home rule is that um, there's a theory that your local government will go crazy and will do stuff that you don't want them to do. And if you're a home rule, if you're not home rule, you, you just can't do that stuff. Um, the flip side is that if you look around, almost all of our neighbors, uh, Winnetka, Northfield, Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, um, all of those communities have recently 
relatively recently chose to become home rule because they thought it was better for the residents and nobody's gone crazy. And the flip side is um, if you are home rule, you can do more for your residents and maybe you can do it for less. And I'm, I'm just going to give two examples. Both have to do with bonds. Um, the bonding is very limited for non-home rule communities. You can't sell bonds, um, general obligation bonds, without a referendum of the residents. And that's, you know, from one point of view, that's a protection. Residents can make sure the village board doesn't go crazy bonding things that shouldn't bond. But the flip side is that if you're not home rule, you are limited to 20-year bonds. A lot of the things the village does are 30-year things, 40-year things, maybe 50-year things. But if we're limited to 20-year bonds, what that means is the residents who live here now have to pay more for something that's going to benefit people 30 and 40 years from now. Home rule communities can have longer bonds so the residents pay an appropriate share. So another example related to bonds. There are experts that advise um, communities and uh, you know companies too, when should you go into the bond market? When is it going to be best? When are the rates going to be best? Well, if you're a home rule community, you can listen to those advisors and you can do it. But if you're a non-home rule community, your advisors say, get in there, and we say, thanks, we're going to have a referendum, and maybe six months later or nine months later we do it, and by that time, maybe it's the same, but maybe it's not. Um, that's just two examples of why I think, and I think many of the village board members think, that it would be a good idea for our residents to let us be home rule. So, so we're just starting to look at this, um, and we're going to, and, and there's a process by which we have to have a referendum, and we're looking at um, when should we have the referendum, and can the, we give the residents a chance to get themselves educated so they can make a decision that they're comfortable, that we're comfortable with. So that was our meeting, uh, that was the committee, the whole meeting that we had on Tuesday, and there will be more about this in the coming months uh, as, as we decide um, first whether we actually want to ask the residents to do a referendum and then when should we do it. The next election is in November. Maybe that's the right time. Maybe it's too soon. There's, a, uh, there's an election after that in March of 25 um, and maybe even further out. That's what we're thinking about and that's what we talked about at our committee of the whole meeting. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Finance Committee, which we just had. Trustee Rubin.
guess, but we've been working on it for a year and a half, I think. So this has been a long process. Um, in February, we did meet and continued our review and discussion of the draft version of the plan. Um, the commission provided feedback on the goals, objectives, and strategies for Big Ideas 4 and 5, which are care for and support the community and deliver excellence in planning, management, and governance. Um, we also began the review of the plan's future land use and urban form um, section of the plan and with a focus on appropriate development in downtown Glencoe and you know what that could look like in the future. Um, next month we will continue our discussion of this future land use and urban form section and we will be talking about Hubbard Woods, the Green Bay Road corridor, and also the village's single family residential district. So you're all welcome to come on April 3rd. Um, and finally, we will be bringing our revised draft of the village to the village board to a community of the whole meeting, committee of the whole meeting um, in April for further feedback and direction from the board. And that wraps up my report. Golf Advisory Committee met this past Monday. Uh, the golf course remained closed in February, but the greens were mowed in anticipation of an early start to the season. Uh, this is the earliest the greens have ever been mowed in anticipation of, of the season, which opened March 1, due to unseasonably warm temperatures. We had IT upgrades that took, took place. Um, the migration of a server was hosted to a local cloud-based service, and this is in regards to the new credit card payment system. Dave Arden attended a convention from uh, the golf course, a GCSSA convention, and then uh, Matt Raddy attended the PGA show. Uh, these are continuing education seminars, uh, enabling them to network with colleagues, earning points to maintain their status, and you know, keeping uh, abreast of all the, all the trends and uh, challenges and opportunities in golf course management. And then there was an uh, presentation or an update from the golf course project and Stella is going to be updating the board on that later today. The next advisory me meeting is on April 15th. Hi, good evening everybody. The SPF had two meetings since the last board meeting. The February 27th meeting was cut short due to severe weather that night. Um, at the ninth, March 19th meeting, we continued planning for the annual donate and recycle um, drop-off event, which is scheduled for May 11th from 10 to 1. There will be many of the same vendors um, that from last year that will accept a wide variety of items for reuse and recycling. We'll, I'll share more details as they are made available. Um, we also are sending an informational postcard in the next week on Buckthorn. Uh, with the goal of educating residents on how to identify buckthorn and encourage the removal of this non-native invasive species from their property. Um, we're also planning events for International Compost Awareness Week, which is May 5 through 11. The highlight of the week will be a panel discussion hosted by the Glenco Public Library called All About Compost. The panel will also consist of residents and community and business leaders with experience in either composting on their own or hiring composting companies. Um, that is all. Thank you. Hi there. The Council for Inclusion and Community met on Wednesday, March 6th. Um, each subcommittee shared the work that they completed over the last month. The communications subcommittee reviewed a set of social media posts created that will begin this month, March. Uh, the events subcommittee continued their evaluation of past council events, and the community feedback committee shared survey feedback from past council events. The full council then discussed opportunities to gather more community feedback to guide future council activities and initiatives. The next council meeting will be on April 3rd at 5.30.
That? No problem. If, if you could just identify yourself for the record. Sure. That's all we need. Um, Seth Jack here, uh, local resident. I live um, across from the Take Up Center in Old Elm Place. Um, so I, w I wanted to speak just about what I saw regarding um, Glenco hiring somebody to promote uh, diversity and equity in our, uh, within the community. I'm, I frankly don't have a lot of details on it. I'd love to know more details on it. Um, I can tell you that from my own perspective, um, while terms like inclusion and diversity, they sound great to a traditionally liberal person uh, like myself and probably most of Glencoe, um, those terms align absolutely with our values. Um, However, we've unfortunately seen that DEI has evolved into a much more dangerous ideology that is far from inclusive, uh, is not interested in a range of viewpoints. Um, even just here locally, I would say that last comment is evidenced by there was, I know there was a member on the committee that was asked not to be on the committee again or not allowed back on the committee as I understand it that person had viewpoints that differed from others on the committee. Um, and, um, and it's my understanding that it's, you know, these kind of efforts are primarily focused on policies and practices that place our most basic characteristics, skin color, religion, gender, sexual identity, at the forefront of decision making. Um, as MLK said, I have a dream that my four Little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character and practices by the village that focus on a person's most basic immutable characteristics is the antithesis of the MLK dream for America. And frankly, as, as I've seen, it opens us up to legal challenges and, and unexpected costs, as we're seeing around the country. Um, companies that embrace DEI um, during the COVID era are unwinding a lot of those policies since they're not only causing discord they're, and distrust, tribalism, divisiveness, um, but they're receiving advice that these policies may be illegal. Um, there's a reason we celebrate Martin Luther King Day and not Louis Farrakhan Day. One value set brings us together based on common humanity and the other divides us um, and causes intercommunal animus. So I have questions. I don't know if I'm allowed to, am I allowed to ask questions? It, you, yeah, you have another 30 seconds. To okay, so my questions would be, promise we're answering them. okay, no problem. My questions would be what, what kind of expenses have um, the taxpayers spent on these efforts in the past? What's the intention of this RFP that's going out? Um, and I'd be curious to know uh, what uh, actions the board's taken um, at the recommendation of the committee. Uh, thanks very much. And, Absolutely. And, you know, um, I'm going to let me do my best. You, you can sit down. You know, but let me do my best to address some of the points you've made. Uh, the, the first point is in discussing the Council for Inclusion and Community, you talked about somebody who had. Uh, dissenting views and they were kicked off the committee. I, I am absolutely not aware of that ever happening. It's, I, I don't think that's ever happened. People. Here yesterday. So, um, so if, if, if I, you know, I don't want to take this opportunity or talk in public about like what could be characterized as some kind of a personnel matter. Um, there was no one who appeared on Tuesday who was on the council and uh, who was ever on the council for inclusion and community and got booted off. It's never happened. I'm not aware of it happening. Okay. Uh, you know, there are, there are all kinds of reasons why people get selected or not selected to be on our various boards. Um, and generally we don't talk about it. And you know, we just don't, you know, people are not, 
the goal here is not to punish people who are volunteers for our community. And the uh, flip side of that is if someone isn't chosen, we wouldn't talk about at a public meeting why someone wasn't chosen. But I can assure you, first and foremost, nobody was on the council, dissented, and was booted off for not following whatever the party line is. That, that isn't the way Glencoe works. It never happened. Um, so let me answer some of your questions. Uh, let me say one other thing. We have something called the Council for Inclusion and Community. That's a relatively new title. It started in the 1960s with the Human Relations Commission. I'm an old guy. I've lived in Glencoe forever. So I remember in the 1960s, I lived in West Glencoe. Uh, my family was Jewish. You couldn't live anywhere else in Glencoe. It was redlined. I lived in West Glencoe, and, and there was an African-American family that um, was moving in. And very embarrassingly, people lost their minds. It, it was not Louis Farrakhan. The, the, the dad was a teacher at Nutra High School. But people lost their minds. And there were other folks in Glencoe that thought that was bad. And so the Human Relations Commission was formed, and it morphed over the years, and it's ended up being the Council for Inclusion and Community. The Council for Inclusion and Community, you know, I would say it's whatever you think about DEI, and people don't necessarily agree, the Council for Inclusion and Community is not a DEI group doesn't have any kind of a special DEI um, ideology. It's, it's, we just want to make sure people feel in Glencoe that regardless of race, creed, religion, sexual orientation, or whatever, that they're welcome here. And that's what the Council for Inclusion and Community promotes. That is, so without picking on Louis Farrakhan, who, by the way, I don't admire, uh, there. Glencoe is not promoting, the council is not promoting Louis Farrakhan or anything like that. Um, the, the village heard from Highland Park that, that if, if they sort of got together with other villages, we might be able to get a consultant who could advise on um, what might be, you know, that somebody called DEI. And what were, we haven't done anything. All we did was um, join with a group of residents to put out a request for proposal to see if this was something we were interested in where we could pay less. Uh, we haven't made any, the Council for Inclusion and Community was not involved in this. Um, there was not a decision by the board or anybody that we were actually going forward with this. But Glencoe, um, we hear it's actually it's sort of well known that um, minorities sometimes feel unwelcome in the North Shore. They may be wrong about that, but they feel that. We have heard from some important institutions around that there is that sensitivity. We've heard it from the Botanic Garden. We've heard it from the Writers Theater, which has you know minority actors and staff, and and so the. The incentive for putting out the RFP was to see if we got a proposal that could help advise us on how we could make Glencoe welcoming as we want it to be. We haven't seen that proposal. I don't know if we'll like the proposal. I don't know if we'll want to spend the money. And none of us has made a decision about that. Um, I did see um, uh, a communication from one of the speakers on Tuesday that was sent to a lot of people that suggested that we had some kind of a DEI agenda. We do not. Uh, the, the suggestion said that the Council for Inc Inclusion and Community had facilitated this. It had not, had nothing to do with it, not consulted, and it said that one of our trustees had stealthily masterminded this, excuse me, total fiction didn't happen. So, you know, where we are um, is we want Glencoe to be an inc inclusive community, and, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that's true. Um, there is this request for an RFP. Um, 
I don't know if anyone's going to tinker with it, but we're going to see, and we'll see what they say. And if it looks like that we think they could be helpful, maybe we'll spend the money. I don't love spending money on consultants. I try not to spend money on consultants. When I was in my private law practice, we actually had a DEI consultant come in and talk to us. Uh, and I thought two things. I thought it was, talked a little bit about um, implicit bias. I thought, well, that was interesting. I didn't know about that, and that's something to avoid. And I also had the impression it might not have been worth the money. As a member of this board, I'm going to encourage us to see if we think it's valuable and whether it's worth the money. But I, I can promise um, there will not be a hint of since we're banding his name around, Louis Farrakhan. Not a hint. Um, and let me just say, uh, my approach in general to village government is I don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good, and I don't ever want to rely on the floodgates argument, which is if you start talking about this, then this, then this, and pretty soon it's Louis Farrakhan. So, we may, so we're not doing that. And let me say one other thing, because at our, at our last meeting, a number of people spoke, and we're happy to have them speak. Uh, and a number of people said they thought that this was the first step in anti-Semitism, you know, the first step towards anti-Semitism. Pretty soon we would have a stealthily anti-Semitic um, enterprise. We're not going to do that, period. We're not doing it. One of the things, I, I've kind of enjoyed being president of the village. People complain to me. They, you know, they don't like something. That it, nobody knows who I am unless they have a complaint, and then they come and they tell me what the complaint is. I, I like that fine. The only complaint that I haven't liked is on three or four different occasions, people have come and said, that the village in general, and I in particular, are trying to run an anti-Semitic enterprise. And that gets me mad, because we're not. We've never been close to it. And anybody who says that is <coughs> misinformed. So that's the story with our RFP. I don't know if it's going anywhere. Um, if it has a hint of Louis Farrakhan, we're not paying for it. We're not doing it. But if it will, if, if we think for the right price, that it'll make Glencoe um, inclusive the way we want it to be, then we'd consider it. So that's where we are. And I, you know, I, and I, I'm glad you came, and I hope you could tell the folks that are telling you that we're engaged in some kind of bad enterprise, we're not. You know, we're here to do streets and sewers and public safety. Um, and to stay on ComEd when they turn off the power, you know, that's why that's why we're here. We don't have any secret agenda um, to, uh, you know, change the world to make it something Louis Farrakhan wants. Okay. Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, well, that was a detour. Sorry, <laughs> but you know, I, you came, and we want to we want to hear from our residents, and we. We take residents seriously. Next report is the Preservation Commission, Trustee Onderdunk. Thank you. On March 5th, the Preservation Commission reviewed a demolition application at 395 Jefferson Avenue. The house is not a landmark, um, nor is it listed as historically significant. The commission had no comments on its demolition. The commission then reviews its uh, five in-progress recommendations and policy updates for the village board to consider. The commissioner felt there was a consensus in favor of at least three of these items, um, one being the submittal requirements for, on, uh, for honorary landmarks, um, second, extending the demolition waiting period uh, perhaps from 180 to even as much as 360 days for honorary landmarks, and uh, three, requiring the owners or owner repre representatives attendance at a commission meeting for an advisory review prior to the issuance of the uh, demolition permit. 
we also reviewed a revised computer, quote, story map. Um, and this is a new feature that's been totally revised for the community that helps users easily identify the historic structures in the village and to filter the search by architect style and construction date. Uh, this, is, this can be accessed through the village website and is a real resource for everyone in the community. Due to scheduling conflicts, the commission canceled their regular meeting on April 2nd and will be meeting on March 28th. Well, you're not done. I know. The next report <laughs> is the Tree Commission <laughs> and Trustee Eiderduck okay. is going to tell us about the Tree Commission. Um, uh, the Tree Commission is a recently formed commission. Obviously, we're concerned about trees. Um, uh, we do not meet every month. Uh, it's every other month. Um, we uh, have had uh, two meetings with staff primarily discussing uh, the planting plans for uh, trees in the public right-of-way uh, and on village lands, uh, also the species selection. So we're getting down into the nitty-gritty on this stuff. Uh, we also uh, have introduced ourselves to the uh, village's comprehensive uh, tree preservation plan, uh, which I believe is also available on the internet. Um, our next meeting will be on Monday, April 8th. I believe it's at 1 or 2 in the afternoon that date. Thank you. Thanks for that report. That concludes the reports of committees. Next item on the agenda is reports of officers. And first, the village manager's report. Take it away, Mr. Corrales. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, all. Um, I have a few exciting items on my, uh, uh, my report this evening. And... Um, I think they will be interesting for you. I'd like to ask that Jeff Maudsley, uh, our public works management anal analyst, provide you with just a brief presentation uh, regarding a subscription-based curbside composting program that both staff and the Sustainability Task Force have been reviewing and working on, and uh, Jeff has more information. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, one of the STF's areas of interest is to promote food scrap composting. According to the U.S. EPA, food scraps and yard waste together currently make up about 30% of what we throw away. This waste takes up space in our landfills and produces methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. The SDF has been investigating ways to make food scrap composting more attractive and accessible to our residents. One thing they've been doing is to promote the use of container swap programs. A container swap program is run by a private service provider. They provide the their subscribers with a sealed container, usually no larger than five gallons. The service provider collects the container on a regular basis, usually every week or every other week, and then leaves a clean, empty container for the customer to refill. Uh, there are two established companies providing food scrap container swap services in this area, Waste Not and Collective Resources. Both companies have a small number of customers in Glencoe that are paying their market rate for the service. Additionally, both have entered into franchise agreements with various other communities in the region, which gives the residents of those communities reduced pricing. The STF requested pro proposals from both of these companies for exclusive franchises, and the STF is recommending that the board enter into a franchise agreement with WasteNot because it offered better prices. Uh, I placed at your, uh, at your seats the comparison that we used to uh, help make that recommendation. For example, the market price for a once-weekly container swap through Waste Not is $40 per month. Uh, however, the price under the proposed franchise is $27 per month for the week once-weekly service. This is over a 30% discount over the market rate. Additionally, there's no other expense to the village. Um, they do this as a pure uh, a subscriber at no cost to us. Waste Not will be the exclusive provider of this service in the village, and this is an opt-in service. So residents will have to sign up for it. They're not automatically enrolled. Uh, we have uh, reached out to LRS. They offer a curbside uh, compost uh, service as well as, par as part of their yard waste uh, collection that's run from April through December. Uh, we ran this uh, concept by them to make sure that it was to articulate our stance that this service did not conflict with our uh, existing franchise agreement with them, and they agreed with that position. Um, we've received a draft franchise agreement from Waste Not, and staff is currently reviewing it. Our goal is to have the agreement finalized and ready 
to uh, request board approval at the April meeting. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. So I, uh, how does this subscription project impact what LRS currently is providing in terms of the drop-off at uh, Public Works Garage? It will not. It will have no, the LRS will still continue that service. That service is written into the LRS franchise agreement, <laughs> and uh, when I pr approached LRS with the container swap program, I made sure to mention specifically that that service will continue, and that is our expectation. So that's another option for residents to to compost their. Do we have a Do we have a feeling for whether people are going to be interested in this uh, enough to? I mean, it's obviously a, a commercial enterprise for waste dump, but do we think uh, residents are going to want to do that? I I once or so a week, maybe sometimes more, sometimes less. I think you know get myself to the public works garage. And mm -hmm. Um, we're hoping that uh, we know that there are customers of both services in Glencoe. Uh, each of them has a handful. We know this through things we've heard from our residents. Um, we're hoping that through this franchise agreement, we can make the pricing more attractive and we can partner with Waste Not to promote this more. And that way we can hopefully expand that market to people that aren't composting at all now. Hopefully the container swap model with you know having a bucket that you just put out by your front door every week they take it away they provide you a clean one so, you, so there's no mess um, we're hoping that that's an attractive uh, program for people that will convince people to start uh, composting okay. that aren't currently doing it okay. I mean, there's, there's no as long as what we're currently doing is still available there's no downside if people want to do it great and if they don't don't have to and we provide and we make it by doing it through us it's a little cheaper I mean, I will say, it, our, our schools have a very robust com food composting program. So um, we're hoping that the kids will be the ones that kind of push their parents to, to do more in this, in this realm. And hopefully this is kind of the, the thing that helps them understand, you know, this is a good service and, and this is, it's pretty easy. You know, we're not asking people to buy these big tubs or whatever to put in their yards or, or figure out some way to leave it by the curb with their yard waste. Um, we're hoping that this is a pretty easy turnkey uh, solution to composting that they'll be able to uh, get behind. I would say as a parent of a kindergartner and second grader uh, in the Glencoe schools, they do an excellent job of training their parents on how to compost <laughs> appropriately. Um, and we have started in our household doing it mainly because they've learned how to do it in school. And, um, but I would say to Trustee Hallwax's question, there's definitely um, been some added interest across the community. Um, we've seen an influx of new families into town, and I think um, they are probably driving some of this interest for sure. No, uh, no. We'll, have, we'll bring, like I said, we'll bring the franchise agreement for approval hopefully next month. Okay, That's as our long goal. as I have a captive audience, let me mention one thing about the, the drop-off program, which I have found works great. Uh, my daughter lives in town. She also uses it. Um, last Wednesday, she said she went, you know, with her bag, you know, her can of stuff to dump it. And when she got there, LRS was emptying the cans, and so she couldn't do it. And then she Oh, okay. And so she came back an hour later, and at that point, uh, Public Works was cleaning out the bins, and so she couldn't do it then, so she ended up driving around for like a day and a half with garbage in her oh. car, <laughs> which was demoralizing to her. So I don't know whether there's a schedule. Uh, it, it, you know, obviously, LRS has to pick it up, and the village has to clean out the bins. Is there a schedule that could be that people would know so they don't show up? I think I think we need to do a better job of accepting even if those circumstances exist. So I would say that should be an anomaly that your daughter experienced. Um, I'm not sure why um, Public Works would have waved her off uh, to not accept or why LRS, frankly, would have. So we'll do a better job of making sure that that's not an expectation that's okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Thank you. 
Uh, we, I don't know if we know how many, but the number of bins out there is the volume that's being accepted by per week. We have, um, we so, have eight. We started with one. We have eight toters out there, Jeff. I think it's six. Okay. Six or eight. Yeah, it's it's a large number. We started with one, and that was overwhelmed quickly, and we've just grown as the as we've seen the demand. Okay. And with this franchise agreement, it's it's this fat flat rate whether we have five percent of our residents doing it or fifty five. Correct. Yeah. The the yeah the. We 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 kind of we just we considered this in the STF level <coughs> a couple of years ago, and we found that uh, the the providers had a minimum subscriber count, but they've dropped that requirement now. So so it doesn't matter if we get five or five hundred subscribers, um, they'll they'll honor the franchise. Okay, thank you. I I I'm, I detected what Gail was asking was if somehow we got a big number, would the price go down? Um, I don't. I, I think their uh, price is flat. The proposal didn't address like scales okay. of of participation. I think that's a question that we would answer perhaps yeah, if we yeah. saw that yeah. kind of okay. um, uh, participation. Um, I don't anticipate it off the bat, but mm -hmm. that may be something that grows over time. Okay. That'd be a great problem to have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because the franchise agreement is how long? Uh, they're proposing one year with three one year renewals, so it'd be it could yeah. pro potentially be four years. We total. could we could adjust. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So we will have that uh, for you likely next month, um, and uh, we'll share additional information uh, at that point in time. So um, you may recall we have an important and exciting project underway, and that is the replacement of the Glencoe Golf Club Clubhouse. There's been a lot of work that's been going on for these past few months. Uh, involving our staff team and our architects, consultants, and construction managers uh, in planning for that new clubhouse. And so Stella Nanos, our golf club manager, is going to provide a brief update uh, to you all this evening on where things stand with the project. So Stella. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. There has been a lot of work going on. I'm just going to give a, a brief summary. I could talk for hours. Um, it's abbreviated. So the project has completed the schematic design phase and is currently in the design development phase. FGM Architects and WB Olson have been working with staff as well as external teams and consultants to manage all aspects of the projects. Discussions and decisions are being made on very aspects, various aspects of the project, such as site planning, stormwater management solutions, sustainability initiatives, and HVAC system options. We have shared preliminary draft plans with the Forest Preserve District of Cook County and the MWRD. We have weekly meetings uh, with WB Olson on logistics and bi-weekly meetings on design. We have reviewed 3D interior design renderings as well as exterior elevations that follow the direction of the ad hoc design review committee. Square footage and seating counts have been established and staff is working on design plans for the kitchen, event space, the main dining area, bar, pro shop, offices, and simulators. Uh, as of right now, the construction schedule is being finalized. We expect to break ground near the end of this golf season and hope to be open a year after we begin. So one of the big issues that has come up recently is the discussion of HVAC systems. HVAC options have been discussed with our consultants and tonight we would like to hear the board's feedback on the option of integrating a geo geothermal HVAC system to the project. So the geothermal option is in line with the recommendations from the sustainability task force and the county's eco-friendly building requirements. We've heard a little bit about geothermal, a couple of brief statements on it. It is a sustainable option that reduces reliance on fossil fuels and has a lower environmental impact compared to tradi traditional systems. Geothermal also has fewer moving parts and can be more durable than conventional systems, leading to lower maintenance costs over time. But there is significant upfront cost. The cost of a geothermal would almost double other options, resulting in an additional $350,000 to $400,000 to the budget. The additional cost is 
due to the need for drilling and installing ground loop of pipes. The ROI is relatively quick, estimated to be seven to 10 years due to the significant savings on energy costs and maintenance costs. So at this point, we would like to know if the board believes that a geothermal HVAC system is an option that we should pursue. And if so, this would have to be integrated into the current design as soon as possible. So we're hoping that we can have a, a great discussion tonight. Uh, Monica is here to fill in the details. I was like, she, did, she was here. She's hiding behind She's here you. to fill in the details. If there's you know, further questions on geothermal, I just gave a brief overview and Phil is very well versed in that as well. I'm willing to answer questions on the clubhouse project. That's more my, uh, my strength. If uh, there's any questions on that, otherwise I'll turn it over to Monica and Phil on the geothermal. I just, I wanted to add, you know, we did talk a bit about this um, in some of our conversations leading up to the referendum and after. Um, the sustainability task force, you may recall, made a presentation to the village board and the committee of the whole meeting where it made recommendations on uh, working to make this the most sustainable building in the community. Um, and uh, frankly, the standards that Cook County uh, has for this building will make it at least lead silver qualifying, which is um, quite sustainable uh, on, a, on a scale. Um, so that's, that's a factor in, in our conversation. Um, we don't want to I don't, I don't mean to make it sound like we're springing this on you. Certainly that's not the intention. And certainly if there's more information that you'd like, we will assemble that. Um, this is, you know, geothermal technology was something we talked about when we renovated the Village Hall's HVAC systems. Uh, we elected not to do it back in 2015 because of the impacts to Wyman Green potentially and the trees that, were, uh, that are in place there. But our three schools uh, in District 35 have all transitioned uh, their HVAC systems to, um, uh, to geothermal, uh, starting with uh, Central West, then they went to West, then finalized with South. Um, in, uh, I believe at Central, they've already realized their ROI um, seven or eight years after the uh, installation, um, and they are seeing rapid um, uh, ROI approaching in both at both west and south. Um, they've been very happy with the with these installations. So um, we recognize, you know, in the in the scheme of what this project uh, is anticipated to cost, you know, in the as we shared with with you um, last month, uh, excuse me, in January, um, you know, that we're probably in the 17 to 18 million dollar total range for this project. Uh, it's not an insignificant dollar figure that we're talking about, um, but with a seven to ten year return on that investment and then perpetual from there, uh, the energy savings is pretty dramatic. And so um, it's compelling, um, but again, we don't want anyone to feel like there's you're on the spot. Um, I, I have had one-on-one -on -one conversations with many of the trustees about this, um, but we want to get your feedback. And if you need more information, we're happy to assemble that, um, bring that back to you next month. I don't think that will alter the trajectory of the project uh, dramatically, but um, if you had thoughts, we wanted to be able to get those from you tonight. If you like the idea, great. If you need more information, great. We're happy to assemble it. Uh, let, me, let me just say, um, I like the idea. It's obviously, the big concern is that we went to the community with a $15 million estimate, and now we're saying, oops, 17. Um, oops, I wouldn't quite say. I, I think what we're saying is it's market-driven. Oh, and, and no, a, I, and I a know, look, I, so, and the, as we move from 15 to 17, and that was like, okay, it's just look what happened to prices in general, and, and at least with that, that's a that's really unfortunate and that's life um this one looks like okay we're going to make a we're going to have a better building and a, it'll be a better investment for the community in the long run um plus it's modeling what we want to model which is sustainability so for all of those reasons um, we're gonna have to make sure we have the money 
um, you know, we, we don't get to print it in Glencoe. It's too bad. You know? <laughs> but um, but it's a, it's just you know it's not like going from 15 to 17 because prices went higher. This is because okay, this is a good idea. Right. More scope and changing. it's gonna and it's gonna based on what we've seen in the village with the schools, it's gonna save the residents and the village money in the long run. So I think we should move in that direction. Trustee Scott. You're first. <laughs> um because I was on the school board when we started to do those projects. Unfortunately, because energy prices are going yeah. faster than that's that's predicted. true. Um, and if you believe that may yet happen, well, the, the delta now it's, you're saying it's a doubling of price. That that was more than what we were looking at. Uh, but nonetheless, if the if the uh, if the rate of return on it pays it back the delta in a seven to ten year under conservative estimate. I personally believe it probably be less than that. I think this is one where it's just a good investment, along with it being uh, a good example to the community of how we do treat sustainability very seriously. <coughs> here our school districts have done it. We weren't able to do it here for physical limitation reasons, but we can do it there, and ultimately, over the long run, the village will benefit because we'll be getting a lot of years of benefit in paper. So I, unless there's awfully good reasons not to do it, uh, I would try to find the Um Yeah, the only awfully good reason I could think of not to do it is if it's a markedly different, and I'm going to show my ignorance about how this, the mechanics of this, so I'm looking at you, Monica. Um, ha does it, is there any shelf life difference? So I know, like at home, my HVAC, replace it um, every 15 to 20 years. Is there, a, is there anything there that is worth considering? I think to Stella's point, the overall maintenance is much lower, but the cost to do repair and maintenance if needed would be higher. And I'm not a full expert, but I, I think that's generally, I mean, geothermal in the way that the infrastructure is set up is varied. Um, and so if, if maintenance were to be required, it could be more expensive, but I think the need for maintenance um, has a much longer time frame um, and is much more infrequent. I think there's a lot fewer moving parts. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. when you think of a traditional HVAC system where you have furnaces and chillers um, that heat or cool a space, you don't really have that with this. Um, there are pump systems and piping systems and antifreeze systems that are a component of that that really are, you know, the pumps are what you find having to replace. Um, I don't know that we have a useful life on those pumps, but I want to say it's like, I don't know. I don't want to guess at that. I, I remember the architects you can talking tell us about later. it. I just, yeah. I yeah. would be we, interested. And we more information mm -hmm. on the maintenance, but it is supposed to be lower overall maintenance. Thank you. Um, Trustee Otterbuck. Um, there is an alternative technology that we were looking at the heat pump technology, which is also green technology. I don't know if, uh, how that costs uh, versus the other, but that is a combined air conditioning and heating uh, technology. Monica, I, you know, I can barely see. It. Is it, it, yeah. those are you know, there's the heat pump and there's geothermal. Uh, 
should we be looking at both or? We, yeah, we were presented with two of them. Um, two of them. more traditional options. Um. Uh, what I think we need to uh, look at, and this is something we can go back to the architecture systems work in commercial grade buildings, as well as geothermal systems. I know heat pumps are very kind of at the residential level um, versus at the commercial. So that's a question we certainly can look into. And if it's a less expensive but meets almost all the same goals, that may be a great path forward, too. That's a very pithy question. Your word Good I'm word. I'm assuming you all did this at the, if you look at um, before the, the federal and state grants, and I'm asking as a contractor at our, at our office, we, we, we were going to do this with solar, and the rebates in the state of Illinois in the past, the next 12 months are 70%. Mm -hmm. They can literally write you a check back for your investment. So I don't have a lot of detail on specific grants, but the number or the percentage that I was given is that typically uh, geothermal could receive as much as 60% in grant funding. So, yes. Um, anybody else? So just a vote counter. I, I think it's safe to say that you should proceed with uh, looking at geothermal, but if you can, um, you know, if it's possible to find out whether there are, you know, other green options that are just as good, we would consider that too. But I, you know, we're interested. It looks like it would be the smart move. So what we'll do is we'll come back to you guys next month with an update just to um, kind of confirm and uh, give a little bit more depth to what we've been talking about tonight. Um, I think. I think this is helpful for us. The, at least there's a interest in doing so. If there wasn't, then we'd move in a different direction. So this is helpful. So we'll, we'll be back next month with more information. Okay. So just a few more quick items uh, for you this evening. Sorry, it's a little bit longer manager's report than you're used to. Uh, vehicle and pet license renewals are underway. Um, all those renewal materials were mailed out uh, to our Glencoe households earlier this month. Um, residents are encouraged to update information and purchase their licenses online. I was the guinea pig last week and purchased mine. I was the first one. I got to purchase mine first. Um, last Thursday and uh, by Monday, the stickers were in my mailbox at home. So. It's very easy, it's very quick. Uh, the information that you need is readily available on the forms that we send out. So I encourage people to do so. Um, we did, as you know, in, uh, implement last year a pilot program for virtual stickers. We're continuing that pilot program as we continue our research into how to better integrate that and perhaps transition our entire program to a virtual sticker system. Um, right now, we'll be reaching out to those who have participated in the past, um, and that information is also, if, if there are others who are interested in participating, that information is available on the website. So more to come. Uh, just a reminder, make sure they're displayed by May 1st. Otherwise, you may incur a late fee. Actually, you will incur a late fee after May 1st. Um, we've been talking a bit about this, and I, I, I've, had a, I've had conversations with all of you um, on and off about coffee with the board. Um, you may recall prior to the pandemic, um, there was a regular quarterly coffee with the board effort that was in place. It was not always well attended, but it was attended. Um, and people were uh, interested in having face-to-face -face conversations with members of the village board and with staff uh, I think our last one was held late in February of 2020, um, and uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we have not reinstituted them. However, I know there is great interest in that. Um, we'll be working out a calendar of trying to get um, those scheduled out for uh, later, starting this later this spring um, and through the rest of 2024, so we can get those on uh, folks' schedules and. Um, what I anticipate we will probably mirror is what we had done last time, which was uh, 
two members of the village board um, to participate along with two mem members of staff so that you had somebody to, uh, to rely on if there was a tough question that maybe you didn't have the answer to, um, we could help out with that. Um, or if you just needed somebody to get something uh, to a resident that had a question for you. Um, so we're gonna work on that schedule and we'll be hopefully instituting those again later this spring. And then last but not least, a number of upcoming things, because uh, as we enter spring, we start thinking about spring cleaning. Um, so just a few things to note. Lakeshore recycling systems, uh, curbside yard waste uh, program starts April 1st. That's coming up pretty soon. Actually, the first collection is on Wednesday, April 3rd. Uh, and that will continue every Wednesday until mid-December. Um, as you begin cleaning up your yards or as your landscapers begin cleaning up your yards, just a reminder, the village's new restrictions relative to the use of gasoline powered leaf blowers are in effect. Uh, actually, uh, gas powered blowers can be used again beginning April 1st through April 30th. If you remember, it's one month in the spring and two months in the fall. The fall is October 1st to November 30th. Uh, outside of those windows, only battery or electric powered leaf blowers may be used. Um, and we have communicated all of that information to all of the licensed landscapers in the community and we have um, done a, a, a bit of information sharing on it. We have a office hours episode. Did we already release that, Sammy, on, on the leaf blower stuff? We did. Oh, boy, I tell you, I should remember these things. Um, but uh, just a reminder, this is the first year for those new restrictions. Um, fifth annual Donate and Recycle uh, drop-off event hosted by the Sustainability Task Force is Saturday, May 11th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Southeast Commuter parking lot. Uh, and anything that you aren't able to donate or recycle, um, LRS is doing our annual spring cleanup event on Saturday, May 18th. Uh, and that's where they collect items at the curb throughout uh, that day uh, in Glencoe. It's only that day as a reminder. It's not all week. Um, and then we will also be hosting a household electronics recycling and document shredding event on June 8th. All this information will be available on the village's website, so I encourage you to look that up. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the village president's report. First item is consideration of a proclamation declaring April 2024 as Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month in the village of Glencoe. We published online and circulated the proclamation. Unless there are questions, is there a motion to approve this proclamation? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Proclamation is issued. Okay, the second item on the agenda is big news for our new assistant village manager, the appointment of Benjamin Wilberg to the official village position of deputy village clerk. Um, is there a motion to approve this? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Congratulations on your new position. It does not require, it does not require continuing education. So consider yourself lucky. All right. That, that, concludes the president's report. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent, consent agenda includes items that have been published online for the community and reviewed by the board members individually or together as part of our committee as a whole. We don't think they warrant any further public discussion. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent? I know we don't have any investment issues, maybe any more. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, is there a, there okay, it's been moved and seconded. I think we need a roll call. We do. Trustee Hallwax, yes. Trustee Listener, yes. Trustee Mialopoulos, Trustee Underdunk, yes. Trustee Rubin, yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Motion carries. The consent agenda is approved. The next item is regular business. And the first item of regular business is consideration of a resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a contract with Lenny Hoffman Excavating Inc. of McHenry, Illinois for the South Green Bay Stormwater Improvements Project for a not to exceed cost of $3,580,000 and to execute an agreement for construction engineering services with Engineering Resource Associates of Warrenville, Illinois 
for a not to exceed cost of $220,321. And I'll ask our Public Works Director, Monica Sarna, to present. Thank you. Um, so just wanted to give you a recap of the project. Um, the project costs, we had budgeted um, about $3.4 million. We went out to bid in February, and the bid opened, opening was uh, March 1st. We had six responders, and the lowest bid came in at $3.4 million. Um, so we're quite happy to see where the bids came in at. Um, we are within budget. We also, as part of this project, we have an MWRD partnership um, of $1 million in funding that is expected to come in. And so we're seeing the total cost of the, the bid plus a contingency plus the construction engineering costs provided by ERA um, for a total project cost of about $3.8 million. Um, the scope of this project, uh, you can see depicted in this image here, um, but the, the, the sole reason of it was to address reoccurring and significant street flooding in the right-of-way and in private property. Uh, what we're looking at is about uh, over 3,500 linear feet of new storm pipe ranging from 12 inches all the way up to 48 inches. Um, we have oversized some of these pipes to allow for additional um, stormwater capacity. Uh, it also includes two storm traps along Woodlawn and Jackson with a total storage of 0.65 acre feet in stormwater storage. And if you're curious what that volume actually means, it's uh, well over 200,000 uh, gallons of stormwater. So if that's a little easier to picture than acre feet, hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> um, so kind of looking forward to next steps, we will be sending out a letter to the residents in this area soon to make them aware of the project and the fact that it's been awarded. Um, we're also going to be setting up a public meeting to allow residents to come and hear more detailed information about the project, um, the timeline, the sequencing, and the impact that it may have on them personally. Um, we'll also be coordinating with South School um, to talk about what events they might have going on this summer. The school dates have been worked into the contract. Um, so we are aware that school ends June 7th and begins back up again on August 27th. And so the contractor is planning to work around and do the major work um, when school is out. Um, so what they'll be doing in the image, you can see the different color um, sections of scope. In red is where we will anticipate full street closures. That is where the storm traps are going in. So that's along Jackson and Woodlawn. Um, everywhere else highlighted in yellow, we can expect lane closures. Um, the busiest corridor in this project scope is Green Bay Road. We will have um, message boards, flaggers will be out there, um, but we do expect there to be an impact um, for traffic throughout this project. Um, they are expecting to start working um, at the beginning, or at the, the end of May, beginning of June. They'll be starting work along Green Bay Road. They'll then start working on the storm traps um, on Jackson and Woodlawn, and then complete the rest of the project um, from Woodlawn down to Euclid. Any questions? Three and a half million dollars here, three and a half million dollars there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been talking about this project for a while. This, yeah, and this is one of um, three of the major projects that were identified for the bond funding um, to address three major flooding areas throughout the village. So this is the final one that we'll be doing. Thanks for all of your hard work. Uh, unless there are other questions, is there a motion to approve the resolution? Second. It's been moved and seconded. We need a roll call. Trustee Hallwax, yes. Trustee Listener, yes. Trustee Mealopoulos, yes. Trustee Onderdunk, yes. Trustee Rubin, yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Uh, the motion carries, so we're going to proceed with this large project. Next item on the agenda is consideration of an ordinance amending Section 5-105 concerning signs of the Glencoe Zoning Code. And I'll ask our Development Services uh, Director, Taylor Baxter, to present concerning the signs. Thank you, President Rowan, members of the board. Uh, this is the final step on our second um, our second overhaul of the sign code. This is really a follow-up overhaul um, to, the, to the bigger project that we did back in 2022. 
Um, uh, you may remember when we came uh, before the board in January, um, there are five items we were really looking at. Those are listed up here. Um, directional signage in business districts, um, permanent secondary wall signage, um, kiosk signs, and then the big one, really, non-residential signs in residential districts, and then a variety of cleanup changes. Um, the process, as a reminder, for zoning code amendments, this is part of the zoning code, um, initial village board consideration, uh, and a referral to the zoning commission. That happened back in January. Step two, zoning commission public hearing and a recommendation. That happened earlier this month. And then we're now at step three, which is the final village board review and decision. Uh, the Zoning Commission met uh, uh, earlier this month, had a public hearing, and discussed these all in, in great detail um, and recommended approval of, of all of the amendments um, with a few minor changes from, from um, staff's original um, proposal. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of them. They're all um, outlined in, in your packet. I'm happy to get into the details of any of them you want to discuss further. Um, a few notable things. Um, the, the bulk of that discussion really focused on the non-residential signage in residential districts. Um, that's where they spent the majority of their time discussing that um, appropriate um, size, number, um, lighting, uh, et cetera. Um, of note, um, ground signs for these um, non-residential signs in residential districts, they wanted to limit them to 32 square feet maximum per face. That's for front back-to-back uh, -back, um, ground signs, six-foot height limit. Um, most of our ground signage uh, that exists now meets those requirements. Um, some are a bit bigger or taller, uh, but that's um, what the Zoning Commission felt was, was standard or was appropriate. Um, wall signs, um, fairly small, um, allowable sign, uh, size here, 12 square feet maximum. There's, we didn't know of any wall signs that exceeded that uh, for this type of use in the village. Um, access safety signs um, as um, proposed by staff. Um, all these recommendations were unanimous, um, with one exception, um, a three-to-one vote to prohibit a internal illumination of ground signs in residential districts. Um, everything else was unanimous. Um, the only uh, internally illuminated ground sign that I know of um, is on Shalom. Um, by a three-to-one vote, the commission felt that we should be limiting those signs to external illumination as opposed to internal illumination. Um, a few more notes on this. Um, there's no proposed loss of any grandfathering for existing signs. Um, we have a lot of non-conforming signs throughout the village. Um, there was some concern at the beginning of this process that we were going to tell um, our churches, synagogues, et cetera, they had to take down existing signage. That is not proposed as part of this. Um, all legally pre-existing um, signs, whether conforming or not, um, can remain. They can't be expanded, but they can remain. Um, the ZBA retains its sign variation authority. Um, and Final note, uh, notification was sent to all interested parties. That was churches, synagogues, golf courses, parks, schools. Um, I believe that's all. Um, prior to the public hearing and prior to this meeting, and we got no comments back from anyone. Um, again, last step, you do have an ordinance in your packet um, for your review, um, which you can review and uh, move to uh, approve or uh, make any changes as you see fit. And I'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, so let me say, we're doing this because the Supreme Court said we needed to. Um, with most of this, there's no right answer, uh, and we're doing the best we can. We've now gotten, you know, we've thought you, the staff has thought about it, the zoning commission has thought about it, um, and I think we should we should go forward with this. If it turns out we've made some huge mistake, which seems really unlikely to me. I would say we should, uh, we should do this. <coughs> Anybody else have a, if not, is there a motion to approve the ordinance? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Let's have a roll call. Trustee Hallwax. Yes. Trustee Listener. Yes. Trustee Mealopoulos. Yes. Trustee Onderdunk. Yes. Trustee Rubin. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. The motion carries and the ordinance is approved. We do not have a closed session, so, um, you know, we're not going to win any prizes for the length of this meeting, but um, I don't think we're wasting time. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>